prior to the development of the induced atherosclerosis. Yeah. Yeah. They put it as the earliest step and they basically said outside in seems to be the earliest part. Exactly. They, yeah. they show that it's happened before endothelial dysfunction. Yes. Yeah. Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hello all. We have a groundbreaking podcast today about how LDL particles, cholesterol, actually interacts with your arterial wall and connects to atherosclerosis and heart attacks. So we're featuring Professor Vladimir Sobotin, and he is a pathologist who has produced several papers with an alternative theory of how cholesterol particles actually get into the arterial wall. And it's quite fascinating. It also has huge implications because it places many of the root causes of atherosclerosis and heart disease that I and others would talk about. It places those at the top table and it places the LDL particles themselves very much in the background, which is the opposite of the current orthodox view of the heart disease and atherosclerosis problem. So, I'm going to go through a few slides just before we get into the interview with Vladimir so you have an idea of what's going on with his hypothesis before we actually get into the discussion. So other thing I'd ask if you could share, download extratimemovie.com that's our new movie website and especially to share it because it helps support our mission here to save people from heart disease and other modern chronic disease. So if you could do that, really appreciate it. And with that, we'll get on with the few slides. So the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, this is really important is understanding the disease process because you'll have no hope of properly identifying the root causes to address if you don't understand the pathology. So basically the traditional model or the orthodox model powerfully held is that the LDL particles come from your bloodstream in the lumen of your artery and they get into your arterial wall from the inside out okay and lots of orthodox people in the business would say that that is the way it is but there's an alternative view is it possible that the ldl particles come from the outside in now that would be really groundbreaking and that's the view held and published on by professor vladimir sobotin and we'll go through some of the details now of the hypothesis. So a short history of cholesterol, very brief. We had Anichkov way back in 1913, and the belief was that cholesterol interacted very much with atherosclerosis. And in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of debates. We had a lot of crazy stuff came out in Time magazine and elsewhere. And then the NIH decided they'd push a consensus and stop the debate. So what was agreed was the elevation of blood cholesterol levels is the major cause of coronary artery disease. And there was solidarity around that and any dissenting voices were squashed. Now, another key thing in the publications over the following decades was the absolute certainty that lipids or LDL particles enter the arterial wall directly from the arterial lumen. So this is the foundation stone of the whole thing. And again, there was solidarity around that, and there still is. It's a dogma that can't be challenged, but we'll challenge it today. So the LDL pathway of getting into your arterial wall is in many, many publications. This is a hugely well-known one, much cited. And basically the progression of atherosclerosis is shown quite simply through from LDL getting into the intima, your inner wall of your artery, through to it building up, immune system getting involved, foam cells, and then you've got a kind of a hot mess of immune reaction. So that's accepted. But important to note is that there's a simple, simple dogma that the LDL particles come in to the intima, the inner layer of the artery. So let's look a little closer at that. So looking a little closer at the morphology, we see an artery here, and on the very inner layer is the endothelium, a single cell layer of endothelial cells. Then we've got the intima, right? And that's shown as usually as a thin layer. Then we've got the media, shown usually as a thick layer with smooth muscle cells. And then the adventitia, which we won't talk about too much. 
But if you look closely at a cross section, again, we see the intima shown thin, the media thicker and the adventitia. But for very small arteries, this picture is pretty true. However, for large and coronary arteries, it's very, very different. So we see the small intima here in the tiny artery. Actually, it's very large in a coronary or a major artery. And the relatively big media in a small artery is actually relatively smaller than the intima in a larger coronary artery. And Subotin noted that the design or this design of coronary arteries pertains to all humans without any exception. And that's correct. So this is really important. I'll just briefly show some more of Subotin's slides. A seven day old here has a very thin intima, really just an endothelium, and the media is relatively much thicker. At five years old, however, the intima is thickening naturally and physiologically. At 15 years old, the intima is almost as thick as the media. See the media here? This is the intima. And at 30 years old even, the intima is actually bigger than the media. And that's the way it is. It's a natural process where the intima gets to be a dense cellular compartment that grows much bigger than the media is. The differentiation of coronary intima into multicellular layered compartment occurs in all humans without exception. Right. Now, there's many publications that show this, no shortage, and they show physiologic diffuse intimal thickening, DIT. It's physiologic, it's normal. But the leading publication on the cholesterol hypothesis, which is Hansen, 2005, and all papers practically, present a completely incorrect design. They generally show a thin intima which is mostly empty and it makes it appear that yeah LDL particles could get in there. Interlopers. Nearly all of the big publications on the cholesterol theory show this incorrect view. That's the way it is. So why? Why would they all be incorrect on fundamental pathology and morphology of arteries? Seems weird. And Subotin suggests that the reason is quite simple. A depiction of the real human coronary morphology is not suitable for the cholesterol hypothesis. Because if you go through the actual real morphology, questions naturally arise, which we'll touch on now. And it goes against the concept that lipids enter the arterial wall directly from the arterial lumen or the center where the blood flows. If you look at the proper mor morphology, that seems unlikely. So that's his belief that all of the diagrams are wrong because it's easier that way and it fits better with the dogma. So we're going to show you now where the cholesterol actually builds up in the intima in your artery. And you may be quite interested in this. And we'll show a visual view, which is from kind of a light microscope, an LDL or lipid view where they've stained for LDLs, right? So you can see where they are and an immune cell view, which we won't concentrate on too much. So basically in a healthy artery, there's your big thick intima. And when you look at it stained for lipid or LDLs, there's none in there, right? So there's no real red staining. We've got our LDLs here and we're going to see where they end up when disease progresses. Very early lipid buildup then, you see that the red staining for LDL or lipids is right down at the bottom of the intima. See this red area? So it's not building up anywhere else. So if they were coming in from the intima, you'd wonder why they're not all throughout or even more concentrated here on their way down. But they're not. Increased lipid buildup, you see this red band right down at the media interface. So again, it's all building up at the base of the intima. Excessive lipid then, when you're at a more advanced stage, you've got all of this hot mess going on here. And pathological intimal thickening, now you can see that there's pockets appearing everywhere. And you're also seeing macrophage moving in and trying to deal with the problem. And here's pathological intimal thickening with macrophage and foam cells. So you can see here all the lipid has filled up the intima and you've got foam cells all over the place, right? But it gathered originally in its earliest stage down at the base of the intima, far from the blood flow, down at the base near the media. So many publications show what I just told you, that this is the way the lipids build up. So this is a fact.
subaltern and his outside in model how could this be true you would wonder so we'll quickly go through it so here shows another cross section and I'm going to introduce the vasovasorum, or effectively the arteries of the arteries. So thick-walled coronary arteries need to be nourished. They're nourished from nutrients from the blood that diffuse into the entoma, you know, small molecules mainly. And then they're nourished, the artery wall, by vasovasorum, which penetrate into the media from the outside. So they're nourished from both sides. But I want you to watch something. When the intima is insulted, and this can occur from many, many root causes that I often talk about, the vasovasorum are sent signals to come in and vascularize or to feed deeper into the wall, right, to help. And they can penetrate into the intima, the base layers of the intima. And they can here easily bring in cholesterol LDL particles. In fact, where they could bring in the particles is kind of exactly where we see it in real life slides, as I talked to earlier. The vasovasorum are a perfectly reasonable mechanism to bring in the LDL, an alternative to the cholesterol hypothesis. Atherosclerotic coronary arteries in many publications fully accept that the atherosclerotic coronary arteries have way more vasovasorum and they penetrate all the way in. This is a classic kind of artifact of atherosclerosis and normal arteries have very relatively few vasovasorum and they don't penetrate so this is in the literature and we have many papers which show that the vasovasorum penetrating are an enormous part of progressing atherosclerosis so it's in the literature so let's look now briefly serious progression towards coronary events or heart attacks and or death Subotin would say that vasovasorum or vasovasora are an enormous part of this. And the orthodoxy would also have to acknowledge that vasovasorum outside in are an enormous part of the real progression to serious atherosclerosis and death. So they both agree on that. However, in the early initiating step, it's where they disagree. So, the orthodoxy would say that LDL particles in the lumen, where the blood flows on the inside, they make their way to the endothelium, to the intima, and then they jump and end up building up, as I showed you, at the base of the intima. So that's the orthodox view, and it's very rarely discussed as to exactly how that happens. Though there are mathematical models, but very few serious proofs. Subotin, however, in his hypothesis, would say that many, many insults like hyperinsulinemia, diabetes, oxidative stress, yada, 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 hypertension, they insult the intimal layer. And the intimal layer is extremely hyperplasic. In other words, when it's insulted, its cells will rapidly multiply and it will respond. And it sends signals to bring in vasovasorum, to bring in neovascularization of new blood vessels to come in and nourish the intima that's in trouble. And of course, if you look closely here, this is where LDL particles would be introduced into the base of the intima, right? Which is what we happen to see in real life slides. So this is Subotin's uh, hypothesis. For the orthodoxy, and here's an important distinction between the two hypotheses. For the orthodox hypothesis, the dominant root cause is higher LDL particle numbers, more invasion from the lumen, right? So that's, that's what it says to us, that it's all about the LDL particles. Whereas Subotin, if you follow his hypothesis, it's all about the dominant root causes being the intimal insult, right? Which is not LDL. It's hyperinsulinemia, oxidative stress, many kinds of rare diseases that cause vasculitis or inflammation, you know, smoking, all the real root causes of heart disease, I would say, right? So this is a big difference. We got to emphasize my, my classic list, the main root causes. So the evidence for and against, and then we'll go on to the interview with Vladimir. So the evidence for the orthodox hypothesis is that the LDL can cross the endothelium. We know that from some papers I went through in talks last year. But transcytosis, which is the main process and brings LDLs across, 
why would evolution design that process in order to give us atherosclerosis? You know, transcytosis, bringing in LDL has lots of other reasons, but not giving us atherosclerosis, surely. LDL can cross, yes, but leaky junctions, another way that LDLs can come across, they're due to root causes. So leaky junctions are caused by our list of root causes. So it's not really LDL's fault if you've got leaky junctions between your endothelial cells because, you know, you're doing other things wrongly. LDL could traverse the intima, could make its way across in principle, but the entrapment is only in the deepest layers. And why isn't there LDL seen throughout the intima in the earlier stages? LDL could maybe traverse the intima, but so far I've mainly only seen mathematical models and diffusion models, not actual proofs, but we're, we're looking for those. Higher LDL could exacerbate the general heart disease problem, but high LDL particles can also exacerbate the problem in Subolton's model, because if you have more LDL particles here and you've caused damage to your intima and you're bringing in you know, blood components and LDLs, more will mean it'll be worse. So this does not distinguish or prove the orthodox hypothesis. And we could say that biglycans, you'll hear that in the interview, the biglycan structures are more concentrated in the deep intima. So the LDLs could come across and only really get stuck where there's biglycan. But there's contradictions in the literature about that, showing biglycan in lots of other areas of the intima, where again, the LDL don't build up. So, you know, this is debatable. Briefly, we look at uh, Subotin's evidence for his hypothesis, and we'd say that all the mechanisms are supportive. But we would say that vasovasorum bringing in the early LDL to the base of the intima is not actually proven yet. It is a hypothesis. Root causes drive the intimal insult that brings in vasovasorum. That's pretty established. So that's four. Intimal insult drives by glycan. So literature shows that the insult to the intima drives the generation of the bike glycans that trap. So again, that's something in support of subolten. Hyperplasia leads angiogenesis. So briefly there, hyperplasia or cell growth of an insulted intima has been shown in some studies to be three weeks ahead of the vasovasorum coming in. So again, the sequence in time supports subotin. The vasovasorum tips at the very tip as they come in. At the end, they're fenestrated or leaky. So they could very admirably allow these particles to come in. Outside in precedes endothelial issues. So other studies show that the vasovasorum are coming in before there's actual endothelial distress seen in certain studies. So again, it's supportive. And I'll skip that one. Perivascular adipose. So perivascular adipose tissue is the fat that's around your coronary arteries. And there's other papers that show that this fat is required to be present to have a problem. And this is an outside-in phenomenon. And vasovasorum are required for significant atherosclerosis. Wherever you have atherosclerosis, you're going to have vasovasorum, right? So certainly at the scene of the crime, always. And corneal vascularization data. So the study of the eye has shown that when you get lipids in the eye in certain disease states, that it's always preceded by arteries growing in neovascularization into the eye structure before you get a buildup of cholesterol. So it's kind of a proof point from a different area of the body. The strong focal nature of atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis occurs badly in specific spots in the artery, right? And nearby there might be none. So it's very focal, whereas leaking through the endothelium of LDL particles would be a more general thing. And HDL efflux via the lymphatic system. So we now know that the HDL removing cholesterol from the wall actually takes it all out via the outside, right? So it's another proof point. A lot of people don't know that. HDL gathers cholesterol and takes it out via the lymphatic system, which is like vasovasorum, and takes it out to the outside of the artery. So there's no inside out there either.
So these are uh, strong points of evidence put together for Subotan, but I'll go ahead with the interview. And in the coming months, uh, myself and several more doctors and researchers around the world are going to be exploring this further to see if we can really answer the question. I'm here at CrossFit Health a conference for MDs and I have finally met up with Vladimir Subatin which is a pleasure and a privilege. Pleasure is mine. <laughs> Not at all. Well we're going to talk today about something that's a little complex but afterwards I'm going to put in slides and that to help people uh, understand because I think this is a really important uh, hypothesis that you have generated and you've d or presented on today. And basically, it's all around the nature of atherosclerosis and what is the real root cause and the earliest steps. And maybe we'd start with the structure of the arterial wall. And I think most people will know that the current theory is that from the blood or the lumen side, lipoproteins or cholesterol particles migrate into the inner wall and that's the response to retention model. And everyone believes that, but your model is more to do with things from the outside of the wall in. So maybe in your own words, go through that wall structure. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the funny thing is that uh, we always tend to simplify it, uh, whatever we're dealing with. And it's a very uh, natural for a human mind to perceive an artery as an endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells, and that's it. So if uh, LDL particles are inside uh, uh, arterial lumen, you uh, intuitively anticipate that they would just collect under endothelium. Mm. The problem is that uh, uh, atherosclerosis uh, it's uh, not just general disease. It's a disease that affects mostly coronary artery, uh, carotid artery, and few other big elastic arteries. And all of them design completely differently than this one layer endothelium lining. And somehow it missed not by scientific articles, unfortunately it missed by textbooks. And this is the structure of that arterial the wall, wall all of the pathology and all these textbooks currently show you've got an endothelial single cell layer on the inside of the lumen and then the intima is kind of shown as a thin empty yeah. area yeah. but it's actually not in coronary arteries the intima you say yeah. is thick and full of cells full of cells and the elastic membranes and actually it's uh, at least 30 layers of uh, cells together with elastic uh, <coughs> membranes and proteoglycans. And the layer of a proteoglycan that is more distal to, uh, uh, to the arterial wall uh, is a layer that contains proteoglycan by glycan that has a very high affinity to lipoproteins. Right, and that's the by glycan and by distal you mean the inner wall of the artery, you've got the intima, but distal means that right in at the deepest part of in, the intima. In the deepest part of it. Up near the media. Yeah. Deep. Close yeah. to media. Yeah. Close to media. And the, uh, uh, the truth is that an uh, initial accumulation of a lipoprotein uh, takes place in this deepest area without any trace uh, in areas that close to blood. Right, which would be paradoxical yeah. and uh, I found yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. But as, as we know, uh, nature uh, uh, doesn't create paradoxes. It's usually our ideas, wrong ideas that create paradox and uh, it just need to be uh, put in the right way. You know, to be honest with you, I, uh, when I was a kid, I uh, dreamed to be a plumber. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I was very good with a uh, uh, bolt with nuts and uh, I think that uh, though I became a, a doctor, a pathologist, I still have this uh, plumber mentality. I have to, uh, to explain everything to, to myself mm. in a way how it works. The mechanisms mm, should yeah, all make uh, sense. Match each other. Mm. And uh, so far, it's a, to me, it's the easiest way to find truth. 
just simplify model and imagine how this lipoprotein could be accumulated in the deepest area if they come uh, uh, from a lumen of artery. Yes, yeah, so why would they come in through the endothelial inner lining, single cell layer, and then make their way across the intima to the distal or deepest layers of the intima against the media, and I'll put diagrams up for this afterwards, go and collect there in larger and larger amounts, but never stop on that journey. Now, I think in your paper, the people who have the current model of atherosclerosis with uh, response to retention mm -hmm, of lipoproteins mm -hmm. from the lumen, they suggested to work around this paradox that the glycans are down in the distal layers and the lipoproteins simply migrate along until they get there and then get stuck there. Yeah, yeah, but there is no, uh, there is no force uh, that would uh, help lipoprotein just to diffuse through. Yeah, and uh, um, and through there's a lot of smooth muscle cell, yeah. and, and fi this is not an empty space as is shown in all the diagrams. They're yeah, incorrect. It's a, yeah, it's they it, got to force their way through. It's a it's a very compact, uh, very compact mm. tissue, uh, and uh, then more close it come to tunica media, then more compact it is. Yeah, more and more dense, and yet it's yeah. right down at the margin yeah. of the media where all the lipoproteins build up yeah. from the back up towards the lumen. Yeah, yeah. but uh, if, you, if you know that, that all these articles are on a lipoprotein retention, they start to explain these schematic uh, diagrams of subendothelial retention. Then they skip everything and comes to plaque formation to already formed atherosclerosis. Yeah, so a, si a simplistic model rather than simplified yeah. properly, it's just kind of simplistic. Yeah. Yeah, and they leave out all of what we're talking yeah. about. So if the reality, and I think you have all the slides and beautiful diagrams from the Japanese teams showing this build up with time uh, in the distal area, as you described, and not linked to macrophage until later, if that's happening, well then why is that happening? And maybe now we can talk about bringing in the vasovasorum and the, the intimal thickening that occurs with age and maybe with, with root causes that drive heart disease, drive an intimal thickening. And it's the thickening of the intima that really is what starts mm -hmm. atherosclerosis. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, people have to start with uh, learning normal morphology of coronary arteries. If you perceive coronary arteries the same as the artery uh, in your finger, uh, it's not going to work. You have to know normal morphology in order to understand pathogenesis of any disease. And if you know that uh, this tunica intima is a vascular compartment, it doesn't have any vessels. It uh, uh, receives oxygen and nutrients by diffusion, either from arterial lumen or from uh, adventitial vasovasorum <coughs> that can penetrate uh, two sort of tunica media and part of tunica media and whole tunica intima are vascular. Yeah, and avascular meaning that as by their nature as tissues, they are not vascularized, they do not have arteries feeding them, except when the vas of vasorum project. Start to grow in. Mm. But the point is that uh, 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 certain uh, protoglycans in, in tunica intima, uh, they never meet the uh, LDL particles or uh, vascular lipoproteins. Mm. And by the way, it's not uh, one uh, exclusive case. There is another uh, uh, very common disease, uh, cornea lipid keratopathy. Mm. Oh, in the eye. In the eye. When your cornea uh, normally is transparent, but your cornea normally is avascular. Again, for avascular meaning it does not have vascularization, it does not have, not have blood no, vessels. No. It's probably like the intimate diffusion, diffusion, diffusion of from, nutrients. From a fr front camera of eye. Mm. And uh, about 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, it was an article I remember first author Kagan. They showed that uh, a lipid deposition in this cornea uh, uh, keratopathy happens only if cornea previously has been vascularized. 
Right, so this condition, which is common, only occurs when this possibly abnormal or not ideal vascularization has entered the area and brought in blood. Is that not supposed to be there? Yeah, yeah. it's ectopic and, uh, kind yeah. of. Yeah, and it's a it's a common for uh, uh, for biology that tissues that originally separated uh, from a blood they have uh, some kind of privileged status. I was fascinated by this in your paper, I reread a privileged status of either in the eye, this area, until a problematic vascularization yeah. is, is forced to happen for a, for a problem. And then in the intima, these uh, cells or the proteoglycans in the intima have a privileged status as in they are not meant or intended to be exposed to, to blood. Yeah. So when they Correct. are exposed to, exposed to blood components, they have a big reaction. Yeah, they start just to extract. And, uh, and ad uh, unlike uh, LDL particles or lipoproteins that are movable substances, protein by glycan is a part of an uh, uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, matrix, Th yes. They are fixed. They cannot move anywhere. They are uh, fixed together and fixed by collagen fibers and elastic fibers. Right, so you've got a trapped entity yeah that's got a huge affinity for something it should not normally see, yeah. but now with vasovasorum coming right into yeah. that zone, you're yeah. gonna have the problem. Yeah, it's going yeah. to open the door for, for extraction and uh, if uh, there is a new vascularization, nothing can stop it. Yeah, it's, it's, got, it's basically got a back door yeah. of these blood components. Yeah. Now, we'll probably come back again to how it can't come in from the lumen, though we did discuss that pretty well. Yeah. Um, but now, why the vasovasorum do penetrate into the intima, which is a bad thing, which is arguably the precursor to mm -hmm. atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. It is the first step, pretty much, of vascularization of an avascular intima where we have these proteoglycans and now they're exposed to blood components, it all is really strong. What drives the vascularization though, and here I think we get into the thickening intima, yeah. is the real root? Yeah, I think so. I okay. think so because uh, uh, first of all, uh, tunic intima of uh, arteries and particular of coronaries is uh, the most replicating cell compartment. They meant to divide, divide and divide. And uh, in normal heart, they can contain their growth for a, for a life in a majority of people. We know that uh, only a small fraction of people got heart problem. But uh, when it's getting bigger than certain tunica intima, cells in tunica intima uh, undergo hypoxia. And hypoxic cells, by default, start to express growth factors that promote growth of a vasculature towards these hypoxic cells. Yeah. And they express both uh, 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 vascular endothelial growth factor. Oh, VEGF. VEGF. Yeah. And HIF1, uh, hypoxia induced factor one. Right, so this, um, this intima, of course, has to have the ability to uh, grow whenever there's a damage or anything. They have to be able to locally switch from intimal cells into endothelial cells and, yeah. and keep keep that intact because it's crucial for, for the survival of the body yeah. to keep these, these arteries working. But if it gets a little too thick, you begin to not be able to diffuse enough nutrients all the way into the inside edge near yeah. the media. And you begin to get hypoxia and lack of nutrients and begin to get, I suppose, some, some cell death. Uh, I think cell, cell death also, also occurs, but uh, uh, hypoxia is a so fast uh, 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 inducing factor for uh, vascular growth factors that uh, uh, was said long time ago that uh, uh, when tunica intima become enlarged, part of the uh, arterial wall either must die or develop additional blood supply. Right, so actually before there's necrosis or cell yeah. death, there's a rapid VEGF yeah. and the other yeah. uh, signals are yeah. sent out and they basically signal through into the media and say, we need vasovasorum here yeah. now. Yeah. And then the blood yeah. gets in yeah. and then we've got a problem with vascularization of a, an avascular compartment 
and access to proteoglycans now that really shouldn't be happening. Yeah. And now you've got... Well, these are the initiating steps then. But just to clarify, why the widening? Because the widening, just like atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. is focal. So from your diagrams, you would suggest it's not like the whole intima widens consistently all along all the arteries when a guy has a problem or mm -hmm. a gal. <laughs> There's a focal element of expansion of the intima beyond what it should be and to trigger all these problems. No, I think that a part of a, a natural ability of tunic intima proliferate, there is a, some forces, there are some forces that um, uh, block or prevent it. And one of these forces uh, uh, that clear for, uh, from experience, uh, from uh, uh, exercises, from statistic on a resting heartbeat is a sheer stress, sheer stress of, a, of a blood that mm -hmm. pumping into coronary artery. And in certain area, it's appeared to be not sufficiently strong to suppress uh, cell proliferation. Right, and you've got low shear, as you described, yeah. and that might happen in these, like a lot of atheroma develop at junction points. Yeah, at, bifur um, at bifurcations. Bifurcations, yeah. exactly, where there's eddies mm -hmm. yeah. and there isn't a good smooth shear flow. Yeah. And then I guess you've also got genetics to a point that some people might have areas that are not ideal mechanically. Yeah. And then you've got diet, which is an insult. I think you had a great slide that says anything chemical, mechanical, oh, yeah. or it's anything that offends this intima endothelium will drive the thickening. Yeah, it's a, it's mm. a Friedman uh, monograph ah. on uh, coronary artery pathogenesis. It's uh, exactly 50 years ago, wow. 1969. 69, 60. and he, he made that, what I liked about it was, <coughs> some could say it's arrogant, but it was a strong statement of fact. There was no kind of, well, mostly or sometimes, it was no matter what, insult, chemical, mechanical. It's inevitable. It's inevitable you will get yeah. thickening. Yeah. And then the thickening inevitably will lead to hypoxia. The hypoxia. Hypoxia and neovascularization. Neovascularization yeah. of the vasovasorum. And once that happens, you've now introduced lipoproteins and to be honest, a lot of other components into an area which is not meant to happen. Yeah. It's, it only happens when there are diseased vessels occurring. Yeah, and by the way, there are people who argue that it could be uh, uh, new vascularization from the lumen. Uh, oh. Yeah. And I, hmm. Originally, uh, this hypothesis was based on an experiment with the filling of a coronary lumen with a dye. But later, they discovered that they develop very high pressure of a dye in a coronary lumen, and probably they were artificial. Ah, right, I think I remember I heard that. Yeah. So it's in your paper, yeah. they put 10 times the physiologic yeah. pressure, yeah. and they kind of forced the dye in. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's not reasonable. Yeah. And it was another article uh, that uh, studied um, <clears throat> uh, intersection uh, vascularization from either uh, vasovasorum, adventitial vasovasorum, or from, from a lumen just by presence of endothelial cells, because they're supposed to be, uh, represent vasculature. And at the best, they found that uh, uh, amount of uh, new vasculature in initiation of coronary atherosclerosis about 30 times less from a lumen. So with a most liberal uh, estimation, it's a 30 times less. Right. So uh, I think that uh, in, a, in a real life we can disregard uh, this number. So right. whatever we found, it, it goes from adventitia up vasa vasorum. And adventitia being the outer yeah. lining of the artery yeah. in through the media and then into the yeah. intima, outside yeah. in. I, I didn't show this, these slides. I have a probably five or seven slides uh, mm. with a... Um, uh, uh, visualization in a human and in a pig model, uh, in, a, in a model uh, uh, human that died from a heart disease, mm -hmm. coronary artery disease, and pigs with induced coronary atherosclerosis. And this uh, new vascularization from adventitial vasovasorum is like a net that surrounds uh, a vessel. 
So yeah. it's uh, obviously, uh, uh, if anything happened from, from a lumen, it's, uh, it's uh, probably a thousand times less than from adventitial vasa vasorum. And actually, Vladimir, a couple of years ago I posted, many years ago I posted your original paper, mm -hmm. then your 2016 one I think was a, mm -hmm. an update, but I also uh, posted a paper with a porcine model where I think they had vitamin D being looked at and they induced atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. But I remember the latter part of that paper, maybe it's a different one, I put into the, the Vladimir file mm -hmm. because it clearly said that the inflammatory cytokines and components were definitely being introduced from the adventsia uh, from the outside in, yeah. prior to the development of the induced atherosclerosis, yeah. Yeah. they put it as the earliest step, and they basically said outside in seems to be the earliest part. Exactly, they, yeah. they show that it, it's happened before endothelial dysfunction. Yes, yeah. and I, there's more yeah. papers. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. this article. I yeah, this article. I think four weeks. I remember before endothelial dysfunction of any sort. Four weeks before the neovascularization was occurring. And I think they also have done a similar thing in rabbits. So there's actually quite a lot of data out there if you go looking, which absolutely lines up with your hypothesis. Yeah. Now, is there any good strong fact, as an engineer and a problem solver for my whole career, I'm always looking for a fact that destroys my favorite hypothesis, because only by looking for a, um, a conflicting fact mm -hmm. will you ever firm up on the hypothesis being correct. Everyone like the cholesterol guys can look for supporting data for the cholesterol hypothesis. Anyone can find supporting data, but you've got to strive to look for conflicting data. I think, though, there's no clear conflicting data with this hypothesis that I, I'm aware I, of. I would love to see them, but so mm. far I didn't find any, uh. any serious conflicting data. You can find a <coughs> mm. questionable... Uh, 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 population of uh, humans, uh, but uh, it's either supposed to be a good experiment or you're supposed to to show it in a in a real coronary artery. So far, whatever we have got from uh, real coronary arteries mm -hmm. still confirm, uh, uh, let's say, my hypothesis. It's still a hypothesis, yeah. And uh, and uh, I would love to have an opponent that would clearly uh, demonstrate me where I'm wrong. It's, it's a great position to be in with a hypothesis and actually I have argued uh, on the theories of atherosclerosis, uh, genesis and, and progression and all this for many, many years, often with lipidologists, but we are civil. Uh, but there's a few core facts or, or, or phenomena which they rarely reply to. They'll argue about the extent of LDL's involvement and they'll argue around epidemiology and lots of things. But one of the things they will not reply or engage with is your hypothesis paper. And I've just put it to them, you know, what is wrong with this? It's only a five page paper. It's, you know, what do you think? And they won't reply. And that for me is quite telling because they should be able to reply as experts in lipids and ingress theories from the lumen, be able to quite quickly read that paper and start throwing stones at it. But they never do. Yeah, because it's uh, very difficult to, to contradict to this hypothesis because it's based uh, on uh, very good pathological studies that were mostly done by uh, Yutaka Nakashima from Japan and his team. And they published quite a few articles and the last one was uh, in, a, uh, eight, in a 2018. Right. Yeah. So this is up to the present day, not just all of the pig experiments and rabbit experiments and human, but all this pathology is being updated in, with very high quality yeah. images and excellent yeah. quality yeah. Uh, stuff. And, you know, and talking about uh, original cholesterol model, rabbit model, I do believe that Anishkin, Anishkin was a genius scientist and very experienced pathologist. But the truth is that first of all, he made his model not uh, about coronary arteries, his model about aorta. And uh, uh, rabbit, by the way, do not eat margarine. So it's a, it was already at that time criticized because it's not adequate to human atherosclerosis. And did he at the time or afterwards kind of acknowledge that? 
that it wasn't a perfect model and that... Yes, mm. yes, yes. But, you know, uh, the most important uh, um, <coughs> part of Anichkov's work was that he made a model. If you want to, uh, to try your hypothesis, you have to, to have a model. Yeah. So he made a model. And um, interestingly, uh, uh, his pupil, uh, Kapitalina Volkov, <coughs> who uh, described in uh, uh, 1923 uh, uh, intimal thickening in uh, human coronaries. 1923. 1923. And uh, in the same journal, Virchev Archive, she was a, a, a very talented pathologist, and I believe she was the first uh, female professor pathologist in Russia, at least as far as I know. <coughs> and I read all, all her articles. And uh, Anichkov praised her uh, work on uh, uh, intimal hyperplasia. And uh, about uh, 1950, uh, he stopped to mention her work uh, uh, at all. Oh. Uh, I don't have uh, any good evidence to suggest why it's happened. But uh, I know that at the beginning, Anishkov was very impressed by her discovery. And Anishkov knew it because he also was a very uh, extremely knowledgeable pathologist. And why uh, later uh, they switch completely from participation of any proliferation just to LDL cholesterol accumulation, uh, I would say uh, it's still a puzzle for me. I can, I can guess, but it's not, I don't have any reliable knowledge or information. But yet Anishkov knew uh, uh, limitation of his model. Yeah, and he knew that this lady professor had discovered about the intimal thickening and he would have also known about that would trigger hypoxia and would trigger neovascularization. Would he have a feeling for that back then, the vasovasorum, and maybe that's a little early? Uh, no, I think that uh, by 50, 55, it was already clear that uh, adventitial vasovasorum can participate in, uh, and do participate in coronary atherosclerosis. Right, but the idea just never took hold and they went with the simplistic yeah. migration across a concentration gradient, I think they say, of LDL, which is an evolutionary component, just naturally goes into the intima empty space, yeah. which it's not, and gets caught. And, and that's kind of the theory. But there's no richness in that theory yeah, whatsoever. And, uh, and uh, uh, in Anishkov model, uh, there were LDL particles and macrophages. Yeah. As, I, as we know now, macrophages do not participate in any early stages. Yeah, and there were the diagrams, and I'll put them on the screen again, but this build-up in the deep intima, yeah. which has thickened in at the media end, all this buildup of lipoproteins and the macrophages are scattered around yeah. or some of them up are well, at the lumen side. On the surface, only on yeah. the surface. Yeah. And the only, uh, you know, you have to create, again, plumber mind. You have to create a model how it might work. Mm, that makes mechanistic yeah. sense yeah. in sequence every yeah. step. If no paradox. A, yeah, if you have a vasculature that already grew into sort of tunica media and they just need a signal. Yeah. It's a it's a not large large distance. They just need a signal to, to start proliferating growing. That's it. it. And yeah. the signal is provided, and this is pretty much solid as a rock, with intimal thickening going beyond the physiologic yeah. level, and then you force this this yeah. VEGF and you bring them in. Now another thing I'm intrigued by is something Dr. Malcolm Kendrick uh, went through in a podcast we had. And he was talking about the cholesterol in the plaque primarily being sourced from red blood cell membranes. And I found papers recently actually, possibly a reference in your paper or, or a follow-on reference, where they have, I think in a rabbit model, clearly shown that the healthy arteries, there is no erythrocyte or red blood cell membrane components in, in the uh, wall. Uh, or iron or other things that would come from a red blood cell. But in the plaque, they're finding 
large amounts of erythrocyte fragments, red blood cells and iron, and basically they're saying that a very early step of cholesterol supply into the atheroma and free cholesterol could be sourced from red blood cells. So have you been uh, true or thinking much about that one? Because they could, would come in with the Vasovasorum too. Yeah. There is no other way, uh, even if a, a plug is ruptured or eroded, there is no way that, that red blood cells would come from bloodstream. That, that's the thing, and I know, or my <coughs> understanding is, red blood cells are not going to infiltrate, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, an LDL maybe could come in, but uh, a red blood cell is... Bi no, I, I, I don't think that neither LDL particles nor erythrocytes have any invading capacity. Well, yeah, well, yeah, there you go. But certainly not red blood cells. Yeah. I don't think anyone would suggest that red blood cells are inherently atherogenic particles or that they, they would invade. But I think there's clear evidence that there's red blood cell components, a very significant part of the cholesterol, in plaque. Yeah. That's a kind of a, a killer fact, as we used to say in engineering. Yeah, and, uh, and they, they all agree, we all agree that it's a, a worsening plaque stabilities and uh, plug more prone to rupture. But if you already, uh, if you already agree that uh, uh, plug neovascularization is a, a very strong factor in plug uh, instability, why you oppose uh, neovascularization of tunica intima as an initial step? As an initiating step, yeah. and that is a really key point, that the orthodoxy is fully happy to accept that neovascularization and all of what you describe is a huge part of driving, progressing plaque instability, bringing in all these components. It's a huge problem, but only later. will not accept yeah. that it, if yeah. the thing that's the huge problem, why would it not be the initiation also, as per your description? And no one can explain why it's not. They just don't like it. Uh, as a theory. They don't like it because they, uh, they made uh, uh, a monument from uh, Anichkov statement that uh, lipoprotein particles comes with a, uh, uh, with a fraction of a blood directly from coronary artery lumen. So they've built an enormous edifice yeah. now where for 40 or 50 years it's taken as absolute dogma yeah. and belief. And we know that all these dogmas, and we have lots of other ones around, low-carb diets and yeah. stuff, and, but these dogmas cannot be overturned because there's too much reputation at stake. And, and maybe it's not that people are knowing about this. It might be more a cognitive dissonance that they really do believe in their theory and they just take it as absolute gospel. Yeah. It's been there yeah. their whole career. No one yeah. questions it. First of all, it's, a, it's already believe. Secondary, if it's not uh, uh, the uh, uh, cholesterol LDL particles that are coming from a blood, you start to question how you are going to fight this problem. Yes, because by your hypothesis, you would of course put huge resources and effort into the intimal thickening initial step and right. try and stop that or yeah. fix that. But no one's really doing that because they're very distracted by continuing to pile money and effort into cholesterol. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another thing that's tantalizing, uh, Vladimir. Oh yeah, I know what it is. In fairness, it's not completely against the cholesterol hypothesis this, because the lipoproteins through your hypothesis and model can still come in through vasovasorum and be part yeah, yeah. of the problem. And a guy or gal with much higher quantity of lipoproteins yeah, in their blood... They would develop much faster. Yeah. yeah, so this is not contradicting so much the cholesterol hypothesis, but it's just trying to get it right that we know what the true mechanisms and causal chain is, so we can really focus on the initiating step and not get too distracted by cholesterol. Is that no, fair? I will, yeah, mm. I would be more than glad if, uh, 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 if supporters' uh, cholesterol hypothesis showed that it's a really cholesterol and statins can reduce it and uh, the whole story about coronary artery disease disappeared. I would be more than glad. The only reason why I'm participating in this story is that it's never happened. 
Yeah, the statins, as you acknowledged in your talk, yeah. do have a 25% reduction or deferral of yeah. events. They do have functionality. They reduce yeah. particles and, and probably reduce oxidized and damaged particles yeah. too. So, but the problem in your mind is, if you're only reducing by 20 or 25%, what about the 75% of people that possibly we could get an enormous benefit for them if we spent the time and money on focusing on the true root cause, initiating yeah. step? and do something big there. Yeah, and initiating step is a uh, uh, is understanding mechanism which uh, control intimal thickening. And if uh, uh, out of 100 people, let's say uh, 98 could have this uh, normal phenotype, normal intimal thickening for the rest of the life, and two of them goes uh, uh, to develop coronary artery disease and successfully got stenting. Uh, it's probably more reliable to approach problem by studying what controlled in a 98 people normal dimension of intimal uh, in coronary arteries, rather than look for uh, uh, unknown factors, risk factors. What, what does it mean risk factors? We, do not know that it's causal factor, we know that it's associated. Mm. And the risk factors, yeah, the current view of the world is they're actually focusing on the problem at a relatively late stage and therefore the effectiveness they're going to have is limited. The risk factors I'm guessing, when I think of all the actual good risk factors, I mean LDL is a very weak risk factor and even LDL particle count is, <coughs> by engineering standards is weak and mostly it reflects insulin resistance when it's high. So that's its, that's its mechanism. But the hyperinsulinemia, metabolic syndrome, diabetes type two, all these inflammatory diseases like sickle cell, you know, is huge atherosclerosis, I think, because of, of stress on the vessels. Because, and then there's all myriad uh, kind of rarer diseases with big atherosclerosis. But I think all those risk factors and diseases I'm guessing they're all working through the initial step of causing uh, PIT yeah. or pathological yeah. intimal, intimal thickening, thickening and then kicking into gear the sequence uh, downstream of the signaling VEGF, bringing in the vasovasorum, and now you've got the yeah. whole system going. Yeah, but, yeah. but again, you cannot uh, uh, decipher a mechanism uh, of uh, abnormal morphogenesis if uh, it was kicked out of a uh, normal rails by numerous triggering factors or contributing factors or risk factors. If, if there is a cause, I still, I still believe that there is a cause that we can find, uh, examine and control uh, initiation of atherosclerosis. And that, that cause, when you say cause, the root of the problem is the intimal thickening. But the, what causes intimal thickening, though, I'm guessing is there's, there's, a few there's quite a few different ways. Uh, as mm -hmm. you said, the other quote, <coughs> chemical means of offending yeah. the artery, mechanical means. So you're going to end up with a whole or a cluster of primary drivers of that PIT. Yeah. And you're going to have to rack and stack them and focus on the main ones and not get caught in the tiny ones, as is normal. But, but if, you, if, the P, if the whole system was going after that PIT, that intimal thickening, remorselessly and investing and finding out what's causing that, they would rapidly make progress, I of think. Course, in, yes. Of course. And mm. especially if we turn this, uh, this problem uh, all the way around what mechanism maintains stability of a normal ah, intimal thickening? How could you guarantee? Yeah, what, what prevent uh, turning normal intimal thickening into pathologic intimal thickening? Yeah, and you know what? That is yet to be fully answered, but the reality is, if you never develop any trace of diabetes type yeah. 2, your vascular health is going to be way better and, yeah. and tend to yeah. help with that. If you don't have hypertension and mineral in imbalances, if you don't smoke, smoke. Yeah. smoking causes yeah. enormous yeah. inflammatory forces on, on yeah. that. Yeah. So, so it would just be so much more targeted. If this is the mechanism and everyone stared at it, they'd rapidly tease out much more accurately what are the key things to 
fix or, or, or develop a drug for? I mean, there's room for drugs here too, absolutely. No, I'm, or maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, convinced that uh, with the uh, pace of uh, uh, modern uh, drug discovery, if we know a mechanism, if we know a mechanism what prevents pathological intimate sickening, Nothing would stop people to create uh, appropriate drug cytokines, systemic, local, but we have to know mechanism that controlled normal state. Exactly. If you know exactly what you're dealing with, yeah. you could very well get a good drug target yeah. that could achieve a suppression of the thickening while maybe not causing too many side effects. Um, that, of course, is the ideal. Now, you did mention that drugs that uh, limit neovascularization, that they may not be so ideal just simply stopping uh, the natural incursion of the yeah. vascular, because that is kind of needed and that may also take problems out of it. So it really would have to be targeted at stopping the intimal yeah. thickening, not really stopping vascularization in or a, downstream. In a small segment. Because uh, you cannot do it systemically because heart already experienced hypoxia and uh, coronary artery disease is in Norwegian vessels. And uh, I believe that in some great part uh, there are some collateral vasculature that grows uh, into myocardium and supply. If you start to use it systemically, you shut down neovascularization, not just intima, but whole body. Would be, would be down. Exactly. It's just inappropriate. It's yeah. not the right way to go. You'd need localized yeah. for that reason. Because those collaterals are really important for people who have major atherosclerosis yeah. and blockages to, to, to save their life. Um, so, wow, I think we've covered there the core. I think we've even covered some of the peripheral stuff. And I know you have to get back to the conference. Uh, I will say and one more thing, though, Vladimir. I already said I was fascinated. In 2014, I discovered your first paper. And I couldn't stop reading it because it just resonated. It's not that I read it and said, wow, this is true. This is for certain. But it resonated so much and I couldn't see a flaw that it intrigued me and it has ever since. But the other thing is pathologists. There are so many cases where pathologists are on the money. And the lipidologists, cardiologists, many other specialties, they don't understand their pathology. And I had a good friend, Dr. Joseph Kraft, who was a pathologist in Chicago. He died a couple of years ago at 95. And we interviewed him and he tested 15,000 people with, in the 70s with insulin assays, five-hour insulin assays. And I'm going to send you the stuff. I will appreciate it. You, you. you will be interested in this. But the thing was, he never got people to listen to him, even though he had profound findings. But the reason he found them is he was a pathologist and he said that the cardiac people do not understand their cardiac and vascular pathology. And he said that the, the whole area of pathology and um, you know, autopsies in the States died in the 70s. There were some problems with legality of, of, and they, they stopped doing them. And he said that is the catastrophe in modern medicine. They are literally looking at pictures and books. They are not yeah. doing the pathology. Yeah, that and is that true. Resonates that is so true. That yeah. is true because I, uh, I do not believe in anything uh, until I examine it under microscope. Exactly. Because and then, then I know that it's, a, it's a real. You have validated it physically yeah. with your eyes, with the right equipment. And in engineering, it's actually very similar. We have an autopsy lab and we have electron microscopes and all for complex products. And autopsy, when you have an issue, is an enormous part of resolving it. We have literally teams of people working around the clock, autopsying microelectronic fluidic parts. If you took that away from us, we would not fix the problems. It's huge. And yet in the human body, it seems to be just almost not taken notice of, even in textbooks. You know what? I think that uh, at some moment, mm, uh, people are losing ability to be amazed by facts. I like that. And, mm. um, there's a guy who worked in Vienna in, uh, uh, I believe it was the 1840s. And there were two obstetric hospitals in Vienna. Mm. And he worked in one of them. 
Semmelweis. Semmelweis. Yes, yes. with the yes. Uh, postpartum or the, yeah, the, yeah, 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 wow. So mm. to him, it was a, a complete paradox that in one hospital, patient dying 10 times uh, uh, more often than in another. Yeah. But he was the only one who see it as a, as a paradox. And paradox means that something wrong uh, uh, in our hypothesis. Yeah, there has to be a, yeah. a reason yeah. and you must find the reason. Yeah. And he found this reason mm. that in one hospital, the same people who uh, uh, were uh, involved in delivery, they did post-mortem exam of dead people. Pathogens on their hands. And, yeah, mm. and the simple washing with a chloride water solved this problem completely. But people didn't believe him, though he, they saw it. And apparently with Semmelweis, I think, he was, he was criticized by the top guy in Europe from the stage at some function, uh, and he was even, ruined. Even, even worse, uh, he was put in a, a, a secret, psychiatric yard and was beaten uh, 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 in a two or three weeks and died uh, uh, from a kidney failure. He was so persistent in his idea that, guys, let's wash our hands. But at this time, doctor supposed to be a gentleman, and gentleman hands mm -hmm. cannot be d dirty. Not be seen to be unclean, yeah. yeah so yeah. they would not accept it. And they also lack the intellectual curiosity, it appears, mm -hmm. to look at that data and his graphs yeah. and just say, wow, there's something huge here. How could they not look at that and be, and be fascinated like I would or you, you know, would? You know, because people used to. People yeah. used to say, okay, we know that in one hospital, the uh, rate of death is 10 times higher. Okay. So, and, and now I consider there are people who are losing ability to be amazed. Yeah, and possibly modern medical practitioners, in fairness, I have so many friends in the business, it can be very intense, extremely busy. You come out of college with huge debts, you've got to work so hard. It, they're limited resources now, they're trying to get more out of the system. So it can, in fairness, be very hard for people to go and research and think outside the box. I'm just saying in their defense, but I'm not sure what the defense is for lipidologists and top specialists who would, should, and absolutely it, it, it behooves them to explore things like this and look for the truth, because that's their role, they're lipidologists. They're not dealing with patients every day in the office. They're, you know, all the theoreticians should be getting this and, and bringing it out with vibrant discussion and forums. And I would say that they have a, they have a very, uh, very good, great uh, uh, instrumental part. Mm. They can measure everything in any tissue, but you have to have a hypothesis uh, to, to, test. to test. And they may not be trying too mm. hard to test against their own hypothesis, mm. of course. Who would want to, who would fund it, who would even want to know that your hypothesis is kind of wrong? That's unthinkable, just like the, the hand washing. Yeah. So, yeah, now that's fascinating. And you know, we're going to have to wrap it up, but uh, this has yeah. been really great, yeah. Vladimir. Fantastic talking to you. It was my pleasure to meet you. you finally. Oh, and yourself yeah. too. Okay. And I'll put some diagrams in with okay. this so we can explain it all. Okay. Thank you, Thank Vladimir. You. Thank uh, you. Thanks for tuning in guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen and go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.